welcome to the American Museum of Tort Law and another in our continuing series of interesting talks with interesting people on law-related subjects. I'm Rick Newman, Executive Director of the Museum. Our guest today is Adam Wolf of Pfeiffer Wolf, who is a nationally known expert on embryo law, which has to do with fertility clinics in particular. And here's why this is important. On June 10th this year, June 10th, 2021, after three years of litigation in federal court, a jury returned a verdict of almost $15 million against a fertility clinic and the fertility clinic tank manufacturers for the destruction of fertilized embryos. It's a big verdict. It's a significant verdict. And here is Adam to tell us about it. Welcome, Adam. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So tell us, why is this verdict significant? Sure. And let me try to take a step back and explain a little bit about the work that we have done, my firm has done, Piper Wolf, over the last eight or 10 years in this space, uh, which is that we are starting to see a significant number of lawsuits arising out of misconduct at fertility centers. Very rarely is that misconduct intentional. Um, lots of it is simply negligent, but the ramifications of it are huge. So people all over the country, millions of people use fertility clinics. They do it to try to get pregnant, to have children when they might not be able to otherwise. Now, when in, in, in part of that process, you very often store eggs or embryos at fertility clinics. But while you store lots of personal property in places around the country, storage units and facilities like that, when say you're storing your sofa and something goes awry, okay, it's a problem, but it's not such a big deal. When a fertility clinic uh, ruins or somehow engages in misconduct with your eggs and embryos, it's life-changing. So this is traumatizing for people when their eggs or embryos are destroyed at a fertility clinic. And unfortunately, my firm has seen countless examples of that over the last eight or 10 years. Let me try to explain maybe a few of the types of cases that we have. Um, the first is just a one-off egg or embryo destruction kind of case. That's where maybe you're storing embryos that are both um, uh, genetically normal and abnormal. And you tell the clinic after some time, okay, you could um, get rid of our abnormal embryos, but they pull the wrong lever. They destroy the genetically normal embryos. And then you're left without, without any embryos to use. For some people, that means that they can no longer have children. Then there are larger scale destruction issues, like what we had at Pacific Fertility Center or at university hospitals in Cleveland where there's a disaster, like a tank malfunction that results in the loss, destruction, or jeopardizing of thousands of eggs or embryos for hundreds of individuals and couples across the United States. That happened at PFC in San Francisco, it happened at UH in Cleveland, and the results are devastating. Literally hundreds of families who cannot have children as a result of this. And so at Pacific Fertility Center, uh, we, we, my firm represents about 100 people. My co-counsel represent 100 or more people too. And we have a, we just had a trial in federal court. Our trial team did an incredible job, um, Dina and Amy and others, um, and presented the jury at the end with a question that has never been, to the best of my knowledge, presented to any jury before, which is, what is the value of lost eggs or embryos? With all of the cases that my firm has had, with the literally hundreds of people we have represented as a result of fertility misconduct, never before has a jury been asked to answer a relatively simple um, at first blush, but incredibly complicated question. How do, you, um, how do you provide any measure of justice for people whose eggs or embryos, the most important property they have has been destroyed? And here, the jury came back and issued a verdict for $15 million for five people. Not exactly the same amount per person, maybe a little bit more or less, whether you have eggs or embryos. Um, but as a general matter, what the jury said was vitally important and makes a whole lot of sense. That when your eggs or embryos are destroyed, there is lifelong traumatizing pain 
that result. Yeah, I think that's a the chance to have children. It does. It, it, it can ruin the social fabric of your family. It can fundamentally alter the way that you conceive of your family. Um, and I think hopefully that sends a message that is loud and clear to fertility clinics and tank manufacturers around the country and maybe even around the world, that we need to be far more careful with eggs and embryos and the material that is so vital to our family structures. Now, maybe you would ask, how does this happen? Yeah, how, how could does it this happen? <laughs> Good question. Um, it's, uh, how does this happen? It happens because in my mind, because we have a virtually unregulated industry. It's extraordinary. There are more regulations that pertain to one's barbershop and nail salon than to a fertility clinic. That in many states, you can have a, um, you could store em eggs or embryos in your basement. Just start it up. Virtually unregulated. So what happens behind closed doors when nobody is looking, when there's virtually no supervision? all sorts of mischief and chicanery and, uh, and, and completely negligent behavior, not because people are intentionally screwing up, but because there's virtually no supervision. These are the wild west days of the fertility industry and it needs to end. Well, how are these, the embryos and eggs, if things are done properly, how are they stored? Eggs and embryos are incredibly fragile and need to be stored in very precise conditions. Um, usually that means in a very fancy freezer um, that holds temperatures incredibly low. Um, and that's usually happens with liquid nitrogen. Now, if the liquid nitrogen escapes, um, whether through the top of the tank or there's a crack in the tank, um, there's nothing to keep the eggs and embryos as cold as they need to be. And when you get outside of a fairly narrow bandwidth of temperature, the eggs and embryos become non-viable. Non-viable means? By non-viable, meaning you can't use them. That these, are, these can be the, um, uh, the building blocks for being able to have a child, to have children, to have something that you couldn't have on your own. And if the eggs and embryos are outside of a certain temperature range, that just can't happen anymore. They're effectively useless. So, and what happened in this case was, what sort of failure was it? Sure, there were a number of failures involved um, as it relates to, um, let's say the claims that we have against Chart, which was the tank manufacturer, one of the largest tank manufacturers in the country. There were at least two very significant failures. Um, one is that the tank was manufactured in a defective manner. That led to a crack forming in the tank where liquid nitrogen escaped. As I mentioned before, you need to have that liquid nitrogen in the tank, in the tank to have, ensure that the contents are stored in a safe manner. The other issue is that Chart manufactured an alarm or what's called a controller on the tank that was defective and that it knew was defective, that it had said was going haywire, and yet that it didn't inform its customers had all of these significant problems. You combine those two things, and it was the perfect recipe for a complete and utter disaster. And that's what happened. That's sadly what happened. And so it's really easy to think about the numbers from the jury verdict and think, well, yeah, those are, those are large numbers and the jury understood just how painful it is. But every one of my clients I've spoken with afterward has been very clear that they would so much rather have back their eggs and embryos than to have any amount of money. No amount of money will ever make this right. No amount of money will ever put people back into the position that they should have been. And yet our legal system compensates people economically, and the jury here heard just how devastating it was for the plaintiffs. Do you think that there, I'm asking you to read the tea leaves, I guess, and project into the future, is the fact that this was a verdict as opposed to a settlement likely to lead to long lasting change and improvement in safety and safeguards in the fertility industry? 
I really hope that this is the start, uh, that we can look back in five or 10 years and say that this was the start of something that really changed the regulatory regime around fertility clinics. For some time now, we've been calling for changes to have some regulation, some supervision over fertility clinics, tank manufacturers, all the people and industries involved um, in fertility. I hope that this is a wake up call for everybody. Um, we had a, I had a press conference at the National Press Club some years ago where we were with a client of ours um, who found out decades after um, he had a child that the fertility clinic created an embryo that was um, not, that, that, excuse me, where the fertility clinic created an embryo that used somebody else's sperm. And so this person's, bio, this person's daughter was not his biological daughter. We have cases all the time, unfortunately, where people take 23andMe or Ancestry.com tests and find out that the, that the supposedly anonymous donor uh, that contributed the sperm um, for uh, insemination of the mother was the fertility doctor himself. That is the fertility doctor um, without authorization inserted his own sperm into his patient. That is a serious violation of bodily autonomy. Yeah, as well as medical ethics. Absolutely. And so these are real serious traumatizing events that are arising out of the fertility industry. And let me be clear, the fertility industry has done incredible things. Many people, many doctors who go into it, almost all doctors who go into it, go into it for the right reasons. But like anything else, where there's a lack of supervision, a lack of regulation, we're going to see abuses and we're going to see errors. And when errors and abuses occur in the fertility industry, it can be traumatizing. Is there any organization or, or group of organizations that are working to get more effective oversight and better regulations? No, there are organizations that are fighting against the idea of regulations. There are self-regulatory organizations that are saying, oh, no, no, everything is fine, don't worry. Um, but fertility clinics need to opt into those voluntary self-regulatory organizations and there's virtually no um, supervision or oversight that's truly meaningful um, that comes out of it. All right. So right now there's no citizen movement, as it were, to lobby for more effective oversight or regulation. We get calls all the time from people who say, why is there not any greater regulation here? Um, and we hope that there are enough people saying that, enough conversations at the kitchen table happening that ultimately we do get some serious, meaningful regulation. I hope we see that at the federal level, at the very least, I hope we find it at the state level because something needs to change. Uh, the, the Wild West days of the fertility industry needs to come to an end. Yeah, well, hopefully, as you said, this verdict may serve as the wake up call to say that these sorts of lax oversight, lax regulations, lax practices can't go on. Oh, I very much hope so. Um, we really need to, this is something, the fertility industry is something that is so vital to how, how many, how millions of Americans have children fundamentally alter in incredible ways their family structures, that there simply cannot be the lack of oversight, the lack of supervision that we presently have. Excellent. Well, Adam, thank you very much for talking with me today. This is just very informative, very helpful. As I mentioned before, I'm going to try to set up a talk with Amy and Dina and talk about the trial itself. Please but do. this background and insight is very useful in an area where you would think that it would be highly regulated, that there'd be the strictest safeguards. And it turns out that the opposite is true. It's really surprising. You know, it, it surprised me when I started uh, wading into this. I really hope that through shows like this and other ways we can get the message out that there's real change. Excellent. Adam Wolf, thank you very much. It's a pleasure talking with you. And for you people watching this, you know the drill by now. If you like this, like and subscribe, send comments, and I'll talk to you soon. Thank you again, Adam. Thank you.